We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone. this voyager and receive this message.
Hello, greetings mga ka-spacers natin out there from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And sa lahat po ng ating mga ka-spacers na nakatutok po ngayon worldwide and netwide. Magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. This is your ka-spacer and space commander, Professor Jun Kahigal, welcoming you to another episode of CosmoQuest, a podcast. So for this episode, mga ka-spacers, we will be zooming in on the implications of the so-called space junk. Yan, so malalaman natin yung implications ng space junk to space travel. So mga ka-spacers, so bago po tayo magsimula, please like and share this episode of CosmoQuest so that we could reach more people. Lalong-lalo na po yung mga estudyante out there so that they would be engaged in the sciences lalong-lalo na po ang astronomy. And also mga ka-spacers, bilang tulong nyo na rin po sa amin, please don't forget to follow us on our Facebook page, the Bed and Society of Young Astronomers. Please follow us also on our Facebook page, the Sky Watcher Society of Las Piñas. And don't forget po, follow me on my Facebook page, the Science Guy Ka-Spacers channel. And also, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, The Science Guy, Professor Jun Kahigal. So, like and subscribe and click on that notification bell so that you will be updated on our future videos. So, huwag na tayong magpatumpik-tumpik pa mga ka-spacers and let us learn the implications of the so-called space junk. So, let's go! small piece of space, they call it junk, had been causing a big headache for NASA scientists. Houston is monitoring a piece of debris that could possibly pass in front of the International Space Station's orbit. We're talking about this six-inch square piece, this old satellite. The of it uh, colliding with the International Space Station is within the red threshold. There is not enough time to seek shelter. Traveling at 17,000 miles an hour, After half a century of space exploration, we're now suddenly faced with what's long been a staple of science fiction, an orbiting junkyard of cast-off space debris. Greetings and good day. I am Professor Jun Kahigal and for this lecture, we will be discussing space junk. Now, space junk has been amassing since the first human-made satellite Sputnik 1 escaped the Earth's gravitational pull on October 4, 1957. This momentous event heralded the start of the so-called space age as humans began to explore even further away 
from our home world. A feat that has been repeated in more than 4,700 launches around the globe. But that also means that we have left our mark on space in the form of trash. Now, what goes up doesn't always come down. Take note of that, my dear netizens. And we have been going into space for almost 50 years now. And a lot of things have gone up. So since Sputnik 1, we have been sending objects in space for more than 50 years now. And there are hundreds of thousands of these man-made objects that are zipping around our planet, either in the form of dead satellites or even functional satellites, even nuts and bolts. And these objects, they accumulate or they pile up in low Earth orbit. And this is not good because this may hamper space exploration. But some of these man-made objects, they have returned to Earth. Like this 500-pound satellite tank that landed in a yard in Texas, missing a house by 50 yards. Or even a piece of this Delta II rocket that fell in South Africa. And some of them have landed or they burn up in the atmosphere, lighting up the sky much like a meteor. And some have gone to explore other worlds or space. But a lot of these objects, these man-made objects, are still in orbit. Like this piece of Saturn V rocket from the Apollo mission to the moon in Earth orbit since 1969. Now, I mentioned a while ago that some of these man-made objects have returned to Earth. And there are approximately 100 to 200 of these man-made objects or space junk re-entries each year. Now, for your information, in 2006, a woman in Tulsa, Oklahoma was hit but not injured by a small piece of charred metal mesh that was laid later confirmed to be part of a Delta II rocket that was launched in 1996. But the risk that a person will be hit and be injured by a falling space junk is less than one in a trillion. So even though the Earth has become a hard hat area and we are in danger of these falling space debris. Right now, we haven't heard of anyone actually getting hit by fragments from the meteor itself. So until we do, there is a Tulsa woman who has the distinction of being the only person in the world to be hit by space junk. We talked to Lottie Mae Williams a few years ago. Back in 1997, she went on an early morning walk. She said she saw a big ball of fire streak across the sky and a little later felt something tap her shoulder. At first, she thought it was someone and that scared her. So I took off to run. When I took off to run, I felt it, what, felt it roll off my shoulder and it hit the ground. And like most people, I just turned around to look and I saw something dark laying there on the ground. Well, it turned out to be a part of a Delta II rocket. It was made of fiberglass. She says no one has ever asked her to give it back, so she keeps it locked away in a safe location. I would have ran too. Now, even though statistically there is a one in a trillion chance that a person would be hit by these man-made objects in space, still we cannot remove the possible dangers. In fact, there is a lot of these man-made objects objects still going around the earth. It can be as small as a dot of paint that came off a spacecraft or it can be as big as a spacecraft that has stopped working like a dead satellite in orbit. And would you believe there are about 500 working satellites or spacecraft in orbit that must be protected from the space junk like the International Space Station. The International Space Station with its crew on board must be protected from these space junk. Now, what is out there? What is the so-called space junk? Now, space junk 
space debris are also called orbital debris and space waste. And they are man-made objects that are in orbit around the Earth that no longer serve any useful purpose to us. And they can include anything from entire use rocket stages like the stages of the Saturn V that's still in orbit around the Earth and defunct satellites to explosion fragments, paint flakes, dust, slag from solid rocket motors, coolant released by Rorsat nuclear-powered satellites, deliberate insertion of small needles, and other small particles from equipment. Our belief that what goes up must come down isn't always true. It's estimated that LEO contains 6,000 tons of space junk. GEO is home to 400 dead satellites parked into a higher graveyard orbit where they will remain for hundreds of years. That's a whole lot of junk. So what exactly is out there? Over the last 50 years, we've launched several thousand objects into space. Yet there are only around a thousand spacecraft that are operational at this time. What may surprise many people is that once an object stops functioning, we leave it in orbit. Every single one of these non-operational spacecrafts is a potential source of debris. In fact, most spacecrafts that are launched into orbit actually leave a trail of debris in the process. Upper stage rocket bodies weighing several tons make up a good portion of the junk in space. As do mission related objects like cast off bolts or O-rings. The rest are miscellaneous fragments, exploded rockets, leftover fuel, and the list goes on. And would you believe currently 200 new man-made objects are added in low Earth orbit annually? So this is what we meant by space junk. So these are man-made objects in orbit that serve no useful purpose at all. And this is not good, especially for space exploration. Why? Because space junk or space debris in general can be moving at speeds up to 22,000 miles an hour. So it means that even a small piece of space junk, like a piece of nut or a piece of bolt, can cause a lot of damage like, for example, to the Space Shuttle or even the International Space Station. It can cripple satellites worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And it can even damage research satellites like the Hubble Space Telescope. And would you believe these man-made objects, even though very small but moving at high speeds, can even kill astronauts. Now, actually, this was depicted in the movie Gravity, wherein the space shuttle in that movie was destroyed by space debris. Even the International Space Station was totally destroyed by space debris uh, in that movie Gravity. And this increases the risk of large pieces smashing into each other, breaking into hundreds of pieces, creating a slow cascade of collisions that could create chaos and threaten satellites and future human space travel. And ISS, this is Houston. Explorer, this is Houston. Go ahead, Houston. 
Mission abort. Repeat. Mission abort. Initiate emergency disconnect from Hubble. Begin re-entry procedure. ISS initiate emergency evacuation. Copy all Houston and in work. Matt, immediate return to explore. Repeat. Immediate return to explore. Copy. Explore. Prep airlock. Airlock engaged. Ready to receive. Houston, elaborate. Debris from the missile strike has caused a chain reaction, hitting other satellites and creating new debris. Traveling faster than a high-speed bullet up towards your altitude. Now copy. Copy all. Put a bow on it, Dr. Stone. I can't. The board is still initializing. I'm not going to ask you again. One second. Not one second, now. Shut it down. That's an order. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm done. I'm done. Kowalski, initiate emergency disconnect from the hubble. All right, Sharif, let's do this. Roger, Matt. Houston, update. Well, we have a full-on chain reaction. It's been confirmed that it's the unintentional side effect of the Russians striking one of their own satellites. They shot down their own satellite. Right at disposal. Most likely a spy sat gone bad. Now it's shrapnel. Explorer ready to disengage HSD. Locks releasing in three, two, one. Explorer, new data coming through. What's the blowback, Houston? It's not good. Most of our systems are gone. Debris chain reaction is out of control and rapidly expanding. Multiple satellites are down and they keep on falling. To find multiple satellites? Most of them are gone. Telecommunication systems are dead. We expect a communication blackout at any moment. Wall Street visual of debris at 9 o'clock. Half of North America just lost their Facebook. Explore. Repeat. Expect a communication blackout at any moment. Copy that, Houston. Explore. This is Kowalski confirming visual contact with debris. Debris is from a BSE sat. Huh? Repeat. I am. Dr. Stone requesting faster transport. We have to go. We have to go, go, go. Kennedy reports meteorological conditions. Go, go. Houston, explore. Copy. Explore. Dr. Stone requesting faster transport to Bay Area. Explore, you copy. Explore, permission to retrieve Dr. Stone. You're go, Kowalski. Houston, this is Explore. Copy. All right. We've lost Houston. Oh. We've lost Houston. Oh, crap. Look, we need to get the hell out of here. Need some help there, man. No, don't wait for us. Stop. Man down. Houston, this is Man down. Copy. So that's a short video clip from the movie Gravity. So there are hundreds of thousands of these man-made objects in orbit around the Earth. And they may pose a great deal of danger, especially to manned spacecraft orbiting the Earth like the International Space Station. So ngayon tatanungin ninyo, sino may kasalanan nito? Now, astronauts have accidentally contributed to this litter or space junk. Like in 1965, Ed White Part of the Gemini 4 mission lost a pair of glove on his first spacewalk. Would you believe that? So, nawalan siya ng glove sa kanyang first spacewalk. And that glove lost by Ed White orbited the Earth with a speed of, would you believe, 28,000 kilometers per hour, becoming the most dangerous garment in history so imagine pag yung glove na yan with that speed e tamaan ng isang astronaut na nasa international space station doing a spacewalk so that could kill the astronaut so ayan ang kalat ni Ed White yung naiwan niya yung kanyang glove and that glove orbited the earth with a speed of 28,000 kilometers per hour so delikado yan pag yung glove na yan ay tinamaan ang let's say yung window or even an astronaut eh mamamatay yung astronaut 
Now, other examples are as follows. In July of 2006, astronaut Pierre Sellers reported that he lost a spatula. And that spatula orbited the Earth, kaya ang binigay na nickname sa kanya ay Spatsat. And also, in 2006, a couple of bolts escaped as astronauts were adding a part to the International Space Station or ISS. So, kahit yung maliit na bolt na yan, traveling at about 17,000 miles per hour, can hit a space shuttle with the impact of a hand grenade. So, that's not good. Kasi kahit na malit yung bolt na yan, eh, napakabilis yung movement niyan. 17,000 miles per hour. So, mabubutas. Pag tinamaan ng space shuttle, butas yan and it may compromise the lives of the crew on board. Now, the oldest piece of space junk is still in orbit. That's the second U.S. satellite Vanguard 1 that was launched on March 17, 1958, which worked only for six years, but it is still in orbit around the Earth. Now, like what I have mentioned, not all of the so-called space junk or these man-made objects, they remain in orbit. Now, some of them, they return to Earth. So, most of these man-made objects that enters the Earth atmosphere, they burn up or they fall into the ocean. The most spectacular re-entry was Skylab. So, this was the U.S. space station that was launched in 1973. Most of the pieces of Skylab splashed down in the Indian Ocean in 1979, but some landed sparsely in populated Western Australia. No one was injured, but the U.S. Department of State received a $400 fine for littering from the town of Esperance, Australia. Would you believe that? So, siningil ang U.S. ng $400 fine dahil nagkalat po sila yung bumagsak na pieces ng Skylab eh na bagsakan yung town ng Esperance at siningil ang US dahil nagkalat daw ang US ng mga pieces from the Skylab. Ngayon, hindi lang ang US, even the Russians. The Russians were also contributory to the buildup of these man-made objects in orbit or space junk. And some of their spacecraft have re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. So, hindi lang yung Skylab. Now, in 2001, the Russian space station Mir spectacularly re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and landed in the South Pacific. Pick. Observers in Fiji saw five extremely bright objects crossing the sky. Now, galing yan sa mir and a series of sonic booms were heard by the observers in Fiji. So, yun yung nangyari dun sa Russian space station Mir. And also, on January 4 of 2007, at 6.13 a.m., the body of a Russian booster rocket rocket broke up as it re-entered the atmosphere over Colorado and Wyoming. NORAD or the North American Air Defense Command said it was an SL-4 rocket used to launch a French space telescope Corot in December. The light was described as having an extremely bright head with a tail that emitted sparks or smoke. So, hindi lang yung mga Amerikano or yung mga Russians ang nagko-contribute sa piling up of these man-made objects or space junk in orbit, idamay na rin po natin ang mga Chinese. And China's test on January 11, 2007 of an anti-satellite rocket or ASAT shattered an old weather satellite into thousands of large fragments. 
fragments. So, biruin niyo po yan. So, kahit yung mga ganyang kalalaking fragments with speeds of 22,000 miles per hour, it can do a lot of damage. And this is the worst such episode in space history. So, today or next year or next decade, some of these debris may start a cascade of collisions. So, delikado po yan. That may expand for centuries kasi they remain in orbit around the Earth. And with such high speeds, they can hamper and damage functional satellites or even manned spacecraft. Putting billions of dollars of advanced satellite at risk. Low Earth orbit satellites have become indispensable for the U.S. military for communications, for GPS navigation to guide smart bombs and troops, and for real-time surveillance. But they are also extremely vulnerable, as a just-revealed test of a satellite-killing weapon by China ominously demonstrates. If we, for instance, got into a conflict over Taiwan, one of the first things they'd probably do would be to shoot down all of our low Earth orbit uh, spy satellites putting out our eyes. According to U.S. government officials, after three misses, China last Thursday succeeded in shooting down one of its own aging weather satellites with a medium-range ballistic missile fired from the ground. U.S. sensors tracked the satellite as it disappeared from its polar orbit 537 miles above the Earth and was reduced to hundreds of pieces of space debris after impact with a kill vehicle carried by the missile. The U.S. has lodged a formal diplomatic protest. Was this a provocative move by China? What's the way? Don't know that, but, but we, we are concerned about it and we've made it known. Under a new space policy authorized by President Bush last August, the U.S. asserts a right to freedom of action in space and vows to deny, if necessary, adversaries the use of space capabilities hostile to U.S. national interests. So these fragments from that old weather satellite may remain in orbit for years, decades, and even centuries. And this may affect the International Space Station because these objects, these fragments, travel at high speed, so mga 22,000 miles per hour. And if any of those fragments from that old weather satellite hits the International Space Station, this may compromise the lives of the astronauts on board the ISS. And there is an estimated 4 million pounds of these space junk in low Earth orbit. So, delikado. There is roughly 110,000 objects larger than 1 centimeter, each big enough to damage a satellite or a space telescope or even the International Space Station. Although the U.S. and Russia led the list of space junkers, other contributors include the European Space Agency or ESA, yan Japan, France, and India. So sila po, together with the U.S. and Russia, sila po yung nagkakalat dyan sa low Earth orbit. Now, aside from the mentioned countries, ang Pilipinas po ay hindi exempted dahil nakapagpadala na rin po tayo ng mga satellites in space like yung Agila and yung Diwata. Now, in case mamatay yung dalawang satellites na yan, they would easily burn up in the Earth's atmosphere kasi malit lang po yung mga satellites na yan. We call them cube satellites, yung Agila and yung Diwata. Now, pag namatay yan, yung dalawang satellites na yan, and they would remain in orbit around the Earth, they would pose a danger to other functional satellites or even manned spacecraft like the ISS. So, space agencies such as NASA, ESA, they continue to monitor the debris in space as new objects are added every few days from launches, collisions, and experiments. 
explosions. And as of now, there are no regulations controlling the generation of junk. Only recommendations about minimizing it. So wala pa hong batas, wala pang regulations controlling the generation of these so-called space debris or space junk. Now, the U.S. Space Command monitors space debris and informs NASA and other space agencies when there is a threat. When you think of space, you think of just that, space, emptiness, the void. But when it comes to the space around Earth, it's actually not that empty. It's filled with a whole bunch of junk or space trash. In fact, experts think that there are millions of pieces of debris in orbit, ranging in size from bigger than a softball to smaller than a marble. So what is all of this junk hanging out around our planet? Well, that's the awkward part. It's all our stuff that we've put into space that we just don't use anymore. Sorry, mom. That can be satellites that are no longer working, leftovers from rockets, or stuff that's come off spacecraft over time, like panels or even flecks of paint. Space debris has included some rather unique items too. There's a tool bag still up there that was lost by an astronaut during the spacewalk, a lipstick-sized capsule of Gene Roddenberry's ashes once orbited the globe for a while too, even frozen pee used to make the rounds. Before pee recycling systems were put in place, astronauts used to dump their urine out into space, where it immediately turned into beautiful, shiny ice crystals that reflected the sun. Sure, that's lovely and all, but just like trash here on Earth, debris in space can be a big problem. It makes the space around our planet a congested and potentially dangerous place. You may think space debris is just floating out there all slow-like, but this stuff isn't really floating at all. It's actually zooming around Earth at more than 17,000 miles per hour. That wouldn't be a big issue if everything was moving in the same direction, but there are a bunch of different types of orbits that space trash can be on. Some go around Earth's equator, while others go around the poles, for instance. That's where you run the risk of getting T-boned. It happened in 2009 when a U.S. satellite collided with one from Russia, putting thousands of pieces of debris into space. A similar event occurred in 2007 when China destroyed one of its satellites with a missile, creating a whole mess of trash. Okay, so a little different scenario, but the same result. Even the smallest piece of trash traveling at such a high speed can cause a whole lot of damage if it crashes into something. And if collisions happen too often, then we run the risk of something called the Kessler Syndrome. It's a simple concept. Colliding space objects create even more space objects. And the more debris there is, the higher odds of more collisions. So if we don't keep these accidents in check, it's all gonna snowball until we get so much litter in space that the entire area is basically gonna be hostile to spacecraft for generations. Our best defense against collisions is to basically know where all of this space trash is. Right now, tracking space debris is the job of the Defense Department. It uses something called the Space Surveillance Network, an array of telescopes entirely dedicated to tracking objects in space and figuring out what they are. The network is capable of tracking anything that's bigger than 10 centimeters, so about the size of a baseball. And right now, more than 22,000 objects of this size are being tracked. Once an object is spotted by the network, trackers must determine its orbit and then see if it's in the catalog. To get in the catalog, trackers have to be able to identify a piece of debris all the way back to its launch. If you can't, it's called an uncorrelated track, or basically, we don't know what it is. But ultimately, the main goal is to know the odds of these pieces running into each other. If a satellite has a 1% probability of collision, that's way too high. And you're gonna wanna perform some orbit correction maneuvers with your thrusters to avoid an accident. Even the space station has to move out of the way sometimes when debris is in the area. Of course, correction maneuvers are really only an option for spacecraft with fuel to spare. Nothing can be done for debris without thrusters. Plus, there's a whole ton of small objects that the surveillance network can't see. For those, experts have to create theoretical models to predict where these tiny pieces are gonna be. So how do we clean up this mess? Well, for the satellites in lower Earth orbit, chances are they will come down eventually. There are still air molecules in the upper atmosphere that create drag on spacecraft, pulling them back down to our planet. Those vehicles will mostly burn up on the way back down to Earth, but 
just in case, the U.S. has a policy that satellites must have a plan to deorbit safely when the time comes. That means no satellites are gonna fall on your head. That only works for satellites in lower Earth orbit, though. Many of our communication satellites are in a much higher region, 22,000 miles above Earth, called geostationary orbit. Those are way too high to come back down, so when they run their course, we put them into a graveyard orbit. It's an orbit that's 200 miles up. The hope is that they'll be far enough away to not interfere with our operating satellites. And those satellites will basically stay up there forever. As for getting rid of the rest of this stuff, people have come up with some creative and little kooky ideas. There's a concept known as the Terminator Tether. It's a miles-long cable that interacts with Earth's magnetic field, inducing a current along the tether. This creates drag on spacecraft in orbit, causing them to fall back down to Earth. It's similar to an electric whip that Japan recently sent to space for clearing out debris. Other ideas include adding balloons or sails to spacecraft to slow them down when they're done, or even shooting them with lasers. The photons would impart a small thrust on the object, enough to bring it down. There are a lot of other ideas too, but there isn't anything really viable to solve this problem right now. So in the meantime, our best option is to get better at tracking all this stuff. And that job may soon switch hands. The Federal Aviation Administration has been very vocal about wanting to take over the job of debris tracking from the Defense Department. So soon, the FAA may be the traffic cops of air and space. So ang malaking katanungan dito ay bakit natin kailangan na i-monitor yung mga man-made objects in orbit? So masama ba yan? Now collisions from the so-called space junk can be highly damaging to functioning satellites due to their extremely high orbital velocities at which this junk travels. Some debris has been recorded moving along at 17,500 miles per hour. So, biruin yun kahit maliit na bolt or yung glove na lang ni Ed White traveling at 17,500 miles per hour can cause collisions and can damage functioning satellites or it can even damage the International Space Station compromising the lives of the astronauts on board. And collisions are also known to produce even more space debris. So mas dadami ang kalat. This is the so-called Kessler Syndrome. So, ano yung Kessler Syndrome? In 1978, a NASA scientist by the name of Donald J. Kessler theorized that the volume of space debris in low Earth orbit is so high that objects in orbit are frequently struck by debris. Unfortunately, this multiplies the amount of debris and amplifies the possibility of further impact. Ultimately, the vast amount of debris in orbit could make space exploration and even the use of satellites impossible. So, yun yung Kessler syndrome and this is not good for space exploration. Kessler's question was, if all of these collisions are occurring in nature, what's going to happen to all of the man-made objects we're putting into space? At the time, Kessler's thinking did not align with popular beliefs. Ever since humans ventured into space, we've embraced the big sky theory. The theory holds that space is so big you could launch anything into orbit and it wouldn't collide with anything else. But it turns out that space is smaller than we thought. Low Earth orbit, or LEO as it's called, is home to the International Space Station, the Hubble Telescope, and most of our satellites. In Middle Earth orbit, we find GPS and weather satellites. Geosynchronous orbit, or GEO, the orbit farthest away from the Earth, is crowded with communication satellites. With so many objects careening through the same altitudes, 
it's not hard to imagine that some may eventually collide. Known as the Kessler Syndrome, Kessler's prediction stated that random collisions between man-made objects would create smaller debris that would become increasingly hazardous to spacecraft. The resulting chain reaction would create exponentially expanding clouds of debris. Even if we don't launch anything else into space, this orbiting belt of debris could very well alter space exploration as we know it. Is it possible that we're now at the tipping point of this cascading, uncontrollable event? Alarmingly, in the three decades since Donald Kessler's prediction, the amount of debris in low Earth and geosynchronous orbit has grown at a rapidly expanding rate into a minefield of discarded trash. In the past, most of the small particles came from the bigger objects falling apart. In the future, and we're reaching that threshold right now, the objects are gonna come from random collisions, just like in the solar system. So to further clarify the Kessler syndrome, kindly take a look at this diagram. So ito lang yung sinasabi ni Donald Kessler. So at present, isang damakmak na mga satellites ang nasa Earth orbit. So sa dami ng mga satellites sa Earth orbit, this increases the risk of collision. So let's say nandun po yung ISS, the ISS is in orbit around the Earth. And let's say isang maliit na bolt lang ang nag-collide sa ISS. There is a chance na mag-explode yung ISS and this will launch a domino effect. So yung mga explosions na yan would create even more debris that would destroy all satellites. So, delikado po yan. And this would pose a danger sa space exploration. So, sa dami ng mga space debris. So, imposible po na makapag-launch pa tayo ng functioning satellites sa dami ng space debris or space junk. So, in 1957, halos wala pa dahil yung Sputnik pa lang yun nandun sa Earth orbit. Pero, nag-increase in 1992 and what more in 2015 and what more in 2021. So isang damakmak na ang mga satellites na nasa Earth orbit and this would pose really a danger sa mga functioning satellites and even the ISS. So I hope you would realize the threat of these so-called space junk or space debris to functioning satellites and even to manned spacecraft. So there are some possible solutions proposed in order to minimize the threat of the so-called space debris or space junk. Now, one possible solution is to have an alternate orbit for functioning satellites. Now, sometimes it would require too much fuel to deorbit a satellite from its path. In these cases, it can also be brought to an orbit where atmospheric drag would cause it to deorbit after some years. So, ibilang sabihin po nito yung mga satellites ay eh, dun sila ilalagay sa mas mababang orbit. So, in case na namatay na yung satellite, they would easily burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Now, this has been done. So, the French Spot 1 satellite brought its time to atmospheric re-entry down from an estimated 200 years to about 15 years by lowering its perigee from 830 kilometers to about 550 kilometers. So meaning, nilagay po yung French Spot 1 satellite into a lower Earth orbit. So yung uh, atmospheric drag would cause it to deorbit 
and after let's say 15 years eh, masusulog na lang yan okay due to its uh, re-entry into the earth's atmosphere so yun ang ibig sabihin ng alternate orbit so to clarify further this proposal of having an alternate orbit let's take a look at this diagram so in order to minimize the creation of artificial space debris or space junk satellites nowadays are launched into low earth orbit now satellites are initially launched into elliptical orbits with perigees inside the earth's atmosphere so this would increase atmospheric drag as you could see in this diagram so eventually the satellite will quickly decay and the satellite will then destroy themselves upon re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. So ibig sabihin niyan, masusunog na lang. And this will decrease the time that the satellite will remain in orbit around the Earth. So this would minimize the creation of space junk or space debris. Now, another proposal was raised in order to minimize space junk or space debris. Now, this is the so-called Terminator Tether. Now, when a satellite has completed its task, it could be brought back down to Earth where it could be properly disposed of or recycled. Now, this is through the use of a terminator tether, also called an electrodynamic tether, that is rolled out and slows down the spacecraft. Eventually, the satellite or the spacecraft could be brought back down to Earth where it could be disposed of properly or even recycled. Now, aside from having an alternate orbit, or even the use of the Terminator Tether, other ideas was proposed. But those ideas were either too expensive or unrealistic. These involved putting space debris or space junk back into the Earth's atmosphere by using laser brooms to vaporize or nudge particles into rapidly decaying orbits, also called the Orion Project, or the use of huge aerogel blobs to absorb impacting junk and eventually fall out of orbit with them trapped inside. So those were some of the ideas proposed. But instead, NASA currently focuses on preventing collisions by keeping track of the larger debris and preventing more debris from littering space. So those were some of the ideas proposed in order to minimize the creation of space debris or space junk. After years of space exploration, we've left thousands of pieces of defunct equipment and other junk in orbit around Earth. This trash can endanger satellites and astronauts and make it difficult to get off the planet. So researchers have suggested some very um, interesting methods for cleaning up space. Here are the craziest ones that just might work. I'm Sophie, and welcome to The Countdown. Let's start with every mad scientist's favorite toy, giant lasers. From Earth's surface, a laser beam can zap a piece of debris in space, slowing down the target. And once the trash is moving slowly, it will fall towards Earth and burn up in the atmosphere. On the bright side, this kind of device would be based on the ground. But most nations get a bit nervous when they hear someone's building a giant laser, which could be used to knock their own satellites out of the sky. So this is one idea whose time may not have come. Yet. Why not try an old-fashioned method and snare the trash in giant nets? DARPA is currently developing a new spacecraft called the Electrodynamic Debris Eliminator, or EDI. Despite its fancy name, EDI is a glorified fishing boat. Armed with 200 nets, the vehicle will fly around at low Earth orbit, tracking down and netting pieces of junk. Once it makes a capture, EDI will hurl the debris towards the open ocean, or set it on a trajectory that will destroy it. When it comes to cleanup, even little satellites can make a big difference. The tiny NanoSail D is only about the size of a loaf of bread, but it can unfurl a super thin solar sail. 
To avoid becoming a piece of space junk, Nanosail D catches the sun's rays, propelling itself towards a fiery death in Earth's atmosphere. If we equip all new satellites with solar sails, they'll be able to self-destruct rather than turning into trash. And we might even think about attaching solar sails to junk that's already in orbit, sending it sailing back to Earth. Slingshots are a classic childhood weapon, and they might also be used to hurl space junk. Two researchers at Texas A&M University have proposed a unique satellite dubbed Slingsat. Slingsat would capture a piece of debris, whirl around, and slingshot the trash to its doom. With the momentum from one throw, the satellite could hurl itself towards its next target, saving on fuel. The latest cosmic cleanup method comes courtesy of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA. A satellite will carry a metal tether made of aluminum and stainless steel, which it can attach to a piece of trash. As the tether interacts with Earth's magnetic field, it generates electricity. This slows down the space junk, which eventually incinerates in the atmosphere. This technique is in its early stages. Its first trial run is set to launch in February 2014. A JAXA satellite will unfurl and study the tether without destroying any trash. So instead of developing laser brooms or developing huge gel blobs to minimize the buildup of space debris or space junk, NASA focuses on preventing further collisions by keeping track of those large space debris or space junk in orbit. So that's the focus of NASA. Now, before we end our talk, I want you to think about this. So is space debris just another overhyped scientific issue? Or could this really become a larger problem in the future? Or should we leave all those space junk or space debris up there? Or we should take time and money to bring it down here back to Earth? Now, we would like to know your reactions or your comments regarding these two questions. So, wag ko kayong mahiya. Just type in your reactions or your comments in our comment section. Well, I guess that's about it, mga kaspacers, for this episode of CosmoQuest, a podcast about space junk. So, sana marami kayong natutunan about this episode ngayong gabi. So, bago po tayo magtapos, mga kaspacers, please like and share this uh, episode of CosmoQuest so that we could reach more people, lalong-lalo na po yung mga estudyante so that they would be engaged in the sciences, especially astronomy. And also bilang tulong nila rin po sa amin so that we could continue with our advocacy to share the good news of science and technology. Don't forget to like and follow us on our Facebook page, the Bedan Society of Young Astronomers. Please like and follow us also on our Facebook page, the Sky Watcher Society of Las Piñas. And don't forget to follow me also on my Facebook page, the Science Guy Kaspacers channel. And meron din po kong YouTube channel, the Science Guy Professor Jun Kahigal. Please like and subscribe and click on that notification bell so that you will be updated on my future videos. So hanggang dito na lang po tayo mga kaspacers. Maraming maraming salamat sa inyong walang sawang, panunood at pakikinig dito sa CosmoQuest, a podcast. This is your kaspacer and space commander, Professor Jun Kahigal saying, live long and prosper. And don't forget mga kaspacers to always keep your space. So long and see you in our next episode of CosmoQuest, a podcast. Stay safe mga kaspacers. Bye-bye. choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal 
will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone.